like to welcome up um, Dr. Samisi Aono Aono <laughs> from uh, Wanganui DHB. Um, Samisi is a surgeon, so it'll be very interesting to to see his uh, perspective on. Welcome, Samisi. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, I'm very privileged to come here and be allowed to talk to you today. Um, I'm just going to go back. The topic that I was asked to talk to you about today was what are the most common cancers for Pacific people and why? Um, a bit of background about myself. I'm a Samoan New Zealander and uh, I also am part Tongan and I have relatives in Fiji, in Tuvalu uh, and the Cook Islands so, and Hawaii. So I think and of course, we're all Pacific Islanders being in New Zealand, the biggest Pacific Island. So uh, that's my background. I work as a surgeon in Wanganui, and I've worked in Samoa before. Um, so anyway, what I thought we'd do is look at a case, uh, and then we'll go from there to some of the um, problems that people are facing, Pacific people in New Zealand, in terms of what are the cancers they're getting, and why are they getting these cancers? And I hope we can end with what we can do about it. And part of that is what we can do today, because this, the organizers of this conference have done something, uh, and you have done something by coming here to start the ball rolling. Okay. Um, I hope you won't be offended by pictures that we show during this, but uh, I apologize for that in advance. I know that uh, people in the Pacific, although we come from very wide backgrounds, um, people share values of being uh, very sensitive about their personal and private uh, dignity. Uh, but I think in the interests of our families, um, it's worthwhile. So this is a case, and this is a case which is actually drawn from many, many cases. So it's got features of, of different cases here. This was a, a Pacific Island woman who was living in New Zealand with her family. She noticed a lump. Uh, and there was no pain with the lump. So at first she wasn't worried. It slowly grew over the months, it didn't go away, and um, she started to get worried, but she was also frightened. After a year, her whole breast started to get red, and the breast was getting bigger than the other one. She was still frightened. She was so frightened that she hid it from her husband. Um, she wouldn't show him the breast at night, and she was busy. She had a busy life, she was working, she was running two jobs, so she didn't want to stop, which is what we all do. That's just a photo of something similar um, to what that woman had. And you can see underneath there is the lump, but the skin is all red and swollen. And it's a little bit wrinkly as well, because she was trying to use, she started to try to use herbal medicines. And with the herbal medicines, it would reduce the swelling of the skin. And when it did that, she would feel better. She would think, oh, it's okay. I'll carry on, which is another thing that we do. After a while, she tried, she thought of going to see a faith healer. Um, and after about eight months, she went to see her GP. And her GP arranged this special x-ray called a mammogram. You're all familiar with? a mammogram, x-ray of the breast. Um, and she put that off because she was frightened of the mammogram. Um, after she had it, she went back to her family doctor and they told her uh, it's probably a cancer and she would have to go to hospital, which was just what she was frightened of. So that's just an example of a, a mammogram, a bit like what she had. And that's the area that they look for, the shadow in the breast, which is... Um, the, the, the doctors would, would be able to tell that was a cancer. It took a month for her appointment to come through at the hospital. She was already thinking she was going to have her breast cut off, and previous people in her family who'd had their breast taken off died. So she thought, right. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that people don't go until it's too late. And then when they go, it happens. And then the next generation come up and think the same thing. Her husband persuaded her to go, and she could feel lumps under her arm. And the lumps are a sign that the cancer has already spread. So, The surgeon took a, a sample of the breast with a needle, 
which just sting, stings a little bit, a bit like a, a, a vaccination. And he saw her a week later and told her she had breast cancer and she was referred for counseling to the oncology nurse. They advised her that she should have her breast taken off because the cancer was too advanced. Uh, she agreed to have that. She had the operation and she was surprised because it wasn't that much pain. Um, after the operation, she was able to go home two days later. Um, but when she saw the surgeons for the results, two weeks later, they told her the cancer had spread and she would need to talk about chemotherapy, which was the next thing that she was really frightened of. Um, and Dr. Simon Allen deals with these patients all the time. And uh, he'd be familiar with Pacific Island people, well, with all women coming in with that same fear of chemotherapy and of the side effects of the chemotherapy. So she tried another healer, uh, and she stopped taking the tablets that they were giving her. After about six months, she started to get breathless. She couldn't sleep towards the end because she couldn't lie down at night. She was so breathless, and she was taken to hospital. Uh, they took an x-ray, and unfortunately, um, she had water building up in her lungs because the cancer had spread to the lungs. Uh, and by this stage, it was too late. Um, her family took her home, and she died a few weeks later. So that's a really sad story. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon. Um, so why did this happen? And what, how can we stop it happening? And what can we do today? So those are questions for all of you to keep in mind and to take home with you because everyone can do something. So I think education is the most important thing. So the next thing really is looking at what are the most common cancers for Pacific women in New Zealand. And it's no surprise I chose this example because breast cancer is the most common cancer. I've put next to them the causes that you can do something about. Well, except for old age. <laughs> you can't do anything about that. <laughs> but where, where there are preventable causes, I've put them down there. Breast cancer is the leading cancer for Pacific women. Unfortunately, it's followed by cancers of the female organs, the uterus, the cervix, the ovary, and then the stomach. And next to it, I've put the common causes. Uh, breast cancer becomes more common with old age, and we can't do anything about that. But we can do something about obesity. Um, obesity causes or makes people much more likely to get breast cancer. Uterus cancer, Pacific women seem to get a lot more uterine cancer than other groups in New Zealand. So it's much higher. We're talking about three times higher, four times higher rates of, of um, uterus cancer. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the uterus is in Samoan. It's called the Toala. Toala in Samoan. Toala. I'm not sure about what it's called in other languages. Um, Siloma, you, any? Anybody? Any Tongan or Fijian? So Toala is where the baby is uh, carried. And the lower end of the Toala is the cervix, where the baby comes through at birth into the birth canal. And the ovary in Samoan is called the Fua. And that's in the women, it's inside the tummy. Um, so all of those areas are where Pacific women are getting cancers. Uh, at, the mo at the highest rate. And uterine cancer, obesity is linked to it. Cervix cancer, um, we don't yet have much of it in our younger women, but in women 65 and older, there's now an increased rate of cervix cancer. And there is something that causes that, which is the wart virus, um, human papilloma virus. And... Um, there is a vaccine available for that. Uh, ovarian cancer is again obesity. Stomach cancer is thought to be diet. 
uh, a diet where we're rich in animal fats and not getting enough fruit and vegetables. There's also a bacteria which um, can cause irritation in the stomach called Helicobacter, which makes us more likely to get this cancer. And this is very widespread bacteria in Pacific people in the stomach. And finally, uh, but probably, as Simon was referring to in his talk, smoking. And that's probably the biggest single thing that makes all types of cancer increase. And Simon said, if we, Simon said, how Simon says, <laughs> if, we, if we reduce, if we stopped smoking today, 30% of the cancers throughout this country would disappear in 10 years. Are there any questions about that so far? I don't know that it's related to having lots of babies. I don't think so. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. All of these cancers are all the female organs that are being affected. And um, possibility with um, women being obese that there are more female hormones um, that they're being exposed to. Um, that may be connected to why why they're developing them, but I don't know why. But I can tell you that these are factors which seem to be increasing the risk of their cancer. Um, we don't know that we've got it. Most people pick it up by contact in their homes, uh, right for, uh, close contact right from an early age, and most people are fine. But when people start to get stomach upset, stomach troubles, if they go to their doctors and they get treated, they can get tested and they can get treatment for it. So the answer is that there is treatment, but uh, we don't know that we've got it until we have a problem. And I guess the key is seek help if there is a problem with indigestion that keeps on causing trouble for you. So these are the whys again. We're eating the wrong foods. We should be having five portions a day of fruit or vegetables. We're not getting enough exercise. We're not coming forward for the screening. Um, for mammography in this, in this region, um, the target is 80% of women should be, between 45 and 69, should be having mammograms every two years. The um, European population are up to about 79%. Um, the Maori population are in their high 60% group, people coming in their high 60s. Pacific Islanders are below 60% who are coming forward to have their mammograms. There's also cervical smear tests. Um, not being vaccinated for hepatitis and uh, smoking. And again, as my colleague said, young women are increasingly smoking. So there's going to be an epidemic of, of, uh, of these cancers coming. What about men? <laughs> you, you need us at least for the species to continue. <laughs> so these are the commonest cancers for Pacific men. And their causes. Prostate cancer. Now, I have to say that not all of the causes of prostate cancer are known, but smoking seems to be one of the things that increases it. Poor diet, obesity, and lack of exercise. Lung cancer, smoking is the big thing. And the tragedy with lung cancer is that the smoker is actually poisoning their whole family, the children as well. And it's the smoke that they are breathing out, or the smoke that's coming off the end of the cigarette, that's the most poisonous. Uh, and the children are getting asthma, as Siloma mentioned. All these illnesses because the parents are hooked on cigarettes. Stomach cancer, again, smoking, diet and infection. Liver cancer, infection with the hepatitis B virus. This is a very common virus. Most people don't know that they've got it, but it's very common in Pacific Islands. And... Um, there is a vaccine available which we could get our children vaccinated and if we did that, we would prevent that continuing. So these are the whys for the men. Smoking is probably number one. Eating the wrong foods. 
not getting five a day of fruit and vegetables, not getting enough exercise, and not getting vaccinated against hepatitis B. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, not not mm. all women with uh, um, cancer are obese. So. Yes. That's right. Uh, I mean, I think that we're talking about how you can reduce the risk for okay. yourself as a, an individual, but also for the overall, for all of our, our community. But you're right. We can reduce cancers, but we can't prevent them all. And there are going to be thin women who don't smoke, who exercise, who get lung cancer or breast cancer. And we don't know why they get them. I was just curious about why um, no colorectal cancer for either men or women. Yes, it, it seems to be much less common. Mm. Um, something like a quarter of the rate of colorectal cancer. But interestingly, um, we're now seeing an increase in young people um, with colorectal cancer. Just in the last five years in Samoa, uh, I'm seeing young people in Samoa who are developing colorectal cancer and it's dietary change. Um, fatty foods, animal fats, uh, not enough fruit and vegetables, and they're now developing it. And they're developing them. The youngest I saw in Samoa was a young girl with was age 17 with bowel cancer. And they're living in the town and they're eating the wrong foods. Mm. So I expect that's going to come here. Excuse me, <clears throat> you um, didn't add alcohol. And for those people who haven't seen this week's listener, there's a very good article that correlates alcohol and all cancers, or most cancers. Right. Thank you for that. Well, that's another good point. Hello, uh, what is the average cost for screening for prostate cancer for men? Uh, I'd have to ask someone else for the answer to that question. Um, I think the problem with prostate screening is that it's not been proven to be beneficial. Um, and so prostate is still uncertain. That the there are trials which have been done which have not yet shown a benefit to men. So the cost... Um, I think, Simon, what was your slide there? You had to screen about a thousand men? No, to pick up one case? 1,400 men to save one person. Um, and the other problem is that most men will have some cancer changes in their prostate by the time they die. But we die of something else. So a lot of us will have those changes in our, in our prostate anyway. Yeah, I think if we look at the look at the prostate glands of 80 year old people who are dead, but you, you have a look at pathology and have a look to see what they look like. Um, many will have small prostate cancers present, and the same goes for 80 plus year old women. If you look at their breasts very carefully after death, you can find very small evidence of of tiny cancers that are starting to form. So it's like they're the, the natural aging events that occur in those glands for men and women. Mm. And if the questioner was asking about the cost of a PSA, which is a blood test um, that might help to diagnose prostate cancer, I think it's around $40, $50. Mm. Mm. But I think that you can focus on what you and your family can do for the, for the things that you can do, the things that you can address. Just a little, um, sit on. Um, you know, even though there's no screening for prostate cancer, uh, just advise our men that if, I think it starts from age 40, eh, Simon? That if they go to see their doctor and if they want to know, there's no harm in asking your doctor to, to have a PSA done. Um, you know, um, it's your body, um, and um, it's like uh, doing a, a warrant, warrant of fitness. If you go to check your heart, your blood pressure, your diabetes, also ask if you're a man over 40 up, why not? You know, for comfort of, of mind. Mm. 
Really? Okay. I've got uh, any other questions? I'll just finish with a summary. Sure, slide. thank you. So to summarize, and the things that prevent cancer also prevent heart disease, also prevent strokes, also prevent diabetes. So the message is the same. Good diet, plenty of fruit and vegetables, five a day. Some meat, have fish, fish is good for you, two or three times a week. Weight, set a healthy weight target, ask for help. Uh, you can get help with, with, uh, with weight loss. Um, the GP surgery um, is, is one way to, to uh, channel that. Pacific Islanders, people have families, you have communities. Use those, organize those church groups, those community groups um, to exercise together, to set weight targets together. And it's, it's not a crash diet, you should lose weight slowly, um, but you, it's something that you can work towards and it's something that you can do as a family or as a group. Exercise. Again, something that you can do together. Again, something that a community can take on, or a family can take on, or a couple. Um, 30 minutes, five times a week would reach uh, what, what uh, government targets are for healthy exercise. And it's not running, it's not going to the gym and lifting weights, it's walking, or swimming, or cycling. So those are, those are the things. It's surprising that they're not actually that demanding, but it's making the time from your busy schedules and your commitments and making the time for your family, but it's worth it. The other thing, I didn't mention the alcohol, but as our listener pointed out, avoiding alcohol or having it in moderation and taking responsibility to go when something is wrong. Siloma was talking about having a warrant of fitness, blood pressure, glucose check. Those are things that we don't know are wrong until we get them tested. Prostate testing, PSA, you could have that, but as I say, it's not yet been proven to be beneficial. But cervical smears, mammograms, they've been shown to be beneficial. They're worthwhile. Don't smoke and um, have your vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you, Smith. Great. Thank you for that, Smithy. Well, um, obviously, um, Simon and Smithy are going to be around during morning tea time. We're also going to have a bit of discussion time after we've had our workshops uh, in the afternoon session as well. So I'd like to invite Anne Ella Moitoa up to the um, stage to have to present her. Um, presentation around screening, which is our last one for this morning. <laughs>